You're welcome to the broadcast of Restoration Provision Ministries International, where people are being restored to God's original plan and purpose for their lives. your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only. Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. this morning. So I just want you to open your mouth, whatever you are led by or you feel like you're saying that, Lord, we plant more seeds into this house. Lord, let your overflow be here. You can speak to the seats, the empty seat next to you, just speak to it. Say, Lord, we thank you for filling this seat. We thank you for bringing in the people. Lord of the harvest, we thank you for multiplying us in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Now we can excuse the children and the youth. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Indeed, it's your breath in our lives. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. As we give them time to go, we're going to look at a uh, key scripture. Um, I know I worry this man a lot. Genesis 8.22, I worry him a lot, man. <laughs> if, if we are there. Amen. But before that, let's just share a word of prayer. Where, wherever you are, you want to share a word of prayer. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you. Father, for your goodness and for your love this morning. We thank you for that which you placed upon our heart. We thank you for the life of our senior pastor, 
Pastor Keteku, we thank you, Lord, for his family. We thank you for the leaders you have elected and brought to help and assist in this mission that in the last 10 years, oh Lord, your favor has been upon this house, upon this mission. We pray that, Lord, your hand will not be lifted from us, that, Father, you continually be with us. Let everybody connected to this ministry, oh Lord, experience of the abundance that you are placed within. We give you all the glory, Father in heaven. We thank you, dear Lord Jesus, our conqueror and ruler. And we thank you, dear Lord Holy Spirit, for you make all things happen. Amen. Amen. It's been a very sweet morning. Yesterday, I, um, last week, I think I was overly excited. And the, the Spirit of God told, told me that today you need to be measured. You need to be calm. Calm. And then I said, oh, say nothing. I'm, I'm there. I'm calm today. So we're going to walk. We're still in our month of, we started the month saying that the theme of the month is what? Sea time and harvest time. We took our key scripture from, from Genesis 8.22. And I read, it says, while the earth remains, it means whilst we are still here, whilst everything is still happening around you, there's going to be seed time and there's still going to be harvest time. There's still going to be cold. There's still going to be heat. There's still going to be winter. There's still going to be summer. And there shall be day and night and it will never. Shall means never. If you ask the lawyers, it will never. Or shall means must. That's actually the word. Shall means it must be. So there will always be and it shall not cease. Amen. We thank the Lord for his word which is true. And today, I, 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 I would just want to take us through what the word of the Lord says. And th this week, it's, it's been a fantastic time. But before I get into that, I'll just try and do a recap of last week. Last week, we, we talked about the seed time and the harvest time. And there were key pointers that came out. We said, everyone experiences a seed time and a harvest time. It is also good that you will know your time and what is expected of you. We covered that for last week. And we said that what? Again, the quality of a seed predetermines the harvest that comes out of it. The quality of a seed. And we spoke, up, spoke about how a seed can be corrupted. We likened it to the GMO process, genetically modified organisms, where we said that natural pure things are grown. Right? So they are bitter tangerines. They are sweet tangerines. God created them for a purpose. Now man has modified, corrupted the initial seed and has created the tangerine that I like. The tangerine that is appealing to me when I see it on my table and it's beautiful. Has everything and is sweet and can never be bitter and doesn't even have seeds. Man has been lured from what the original was. And then we liken it to the fact that when a GMO seed is planted, it's able to pollinate, affect the original. When it touches the original, it changes the DNA of the original. And the original plant cannot be the same. So I likened it to what the Bible tells us. There was an original seed given by God, who is the seed carrier and the seed holder. The earth and all the grounds on the earth is the field of the Lord. And when he planted his seed in Adam, the devil came and corrupted, like the GMO plant, corrupted the seed of Adam. The intention of God for man and the fruitfulness of man was diverted to be the fruitfulness of what the devil wanted. So like the GMO crop, it affected the original. Now, Adam was supposed to produce. And what Adam was producing was death. Just like the GMO seed, it doesn't give seed. You can't replant it. You always need to go back to the people who created it to buy seed from them. That is when the world fell into the clutches and the claws of the devil. That's why the Bible describes him as the ruler of this world. But then he took another Adam. God said, look, my first seed didn't work. I need a second seed. And Hebrews described and Paul said, Jesus Christ, 
the incorruptible seed, Romans 11, 11, right? And 1 Corinthians 15, 22, I think we went through all that. But it says the incorruptible seed was now planted. And that seed has grown. And that seed has become a vine. And that vine says that now you are my branches. You have been put into me. You have been connected back to me. I think that's where Romans 11, 11 comes in. We are what? We've been grafted into him. Now that we have been grafted, we are bearing fruits. Our father is happy because that is what he wants. He says that when I'm happy with you, I prune those I am happy with. For they shall what? Bear more fruits. Yeah, 11, 11, if we expand it, we we'll see what it is. But I don't want us to focus on that. This is just a summary. I don't want to go down that rabbit hole, but stay with me because we're going to build on that for today. So now that seed is supposed to yield. And that's why we said that every seed carries a purpose for a designated generation and a yield. God expects a certain yield. God plant you, planted you as a seed in this time, in this season, because there's something he wants. Now, Jesus was so clear on that, and we'll see that later. He says that, look, when it comes to the season and the time, I have no control because there's one person who controls the seasons and the time, and that is God. So, Nana Boji being here, Jude being here, Nana Boji Mensa being here, Jiriel being here, he has a season, he has a time. And my message today will be telling us why we shouldn't miss our season and why we shouldn't miss our time. There's a reason why you are here. There's a purpose you need to fulfill. There's a time you need to touch. And that is why we are here. And that is why he renews our strength every morning. He says that I give to you life every morning because I have a purpose. I have a destination for you. If you are listening to me out there, he has a purpose. He has a destination for you. And there's a reason why you are here, alive and breathing this morning. So we've been grafted back. The intent of the sower will be established in us. So those were the things we covered for last week. Now, three key truths out of that. And this is the truth. The truth is that God is a sower. The truth is that he's the owner of the harvest. The truth is that the world and everything you see around us here is the field. And the other truth is that Christ is the incorruptible seed. Now, having cleared that out of the way, <laughs> we're going to talk about today. And I, I've been trying to prepare myself for this, but the more I try to prepare for it, the more I get overwhelmed by it. This week I was at my desk working and for a long time I don't take, I don't take any time off. So I decided to take time off my break time and work for my own health for once. Just walk, stretch out, enjoy the sun shines more. So I decided to take a walk and as I stepped out, just walking. In a space of five minutes, this whole thing I'm going to narrate today happened in five minutes. The Holy Spirit said, are you alive? I said, oh, what kind of questions am I alive? Everybody, of course, knows you're alive, right? You're sitting here. I'm alive. Then he showed me just a snap of it. Quick one. And this is where I'm coming from, and I just hope you follow me. It's a question, and I titled it today, Dead or Alive? Are you dead or are you alive? And I'm going to try to explain it. Unfortunately, fortunately, thank you, dear Lord Holy Spirit. Fortunately, you give me the ability to explain, but the focus will be on the dead part because most of the time, we're dead and we don't even know we're dead. And that I'll try and explain that and tell you what, what has been done for us to come alive. In this time of our seed time and harvest, God has a plan for us. So don't, don't get, so ask your neighbor, are you, are, you, are you dead or alive this morning? <laughs> are you dead or alive this morning? <laughs> you see, there's a reason why. Psalm 31.15 says, 
And I know this is not there. It says what? There are things to consider. We live in the time. We live in seasons and times. God has his seasons and times. I think I've explained that. Psalm 31, 15 says that David recognized this and says that what? My seasons and my times are in his hands. He's the Lord who delivers me from my enemies. Matthew 24, the verse 36. I'm just saying this. You note them down. When you go home, you can read them. There'll be an understanding to this as I explain and go on. It says, Jesus said, it is not for you to know the times and the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. So there's somebody who fixes time. A time to be born, a time to die is within God's authority. Nobody determines and predetermines that. But the sower who chooses to sow his seed knows when his harvest is ready. And each and every one of us has this gift. Amen. I know many a time would answer, ah, when, when the question was posed to me, ah, yes, I'm alive. Are you, are you, are you alive? I say, yes, I'm alive. He says, shh, let me teach you something. So, on the walk, this is what I was taught and I want to share. He taught me that, look, there's what you call the state of death. There's a state of death. The Bible describes Jesus as the incorruptible seed which we covered last week. And what is death and what is life? Death is a state of corruption. And life is a state of hope. So if you are seated here, you are full of hope, aspirations, desires, things that keep bubbling. When you wake up in the morning, that which keeps you going is the desire for life, is the desire, your aspirations. Who oh, I'm going to get married. Who oh, I'm going to get settled. Who oh, I'm going to buy that house. Who oh, everything is going to happen. That is life happening to you. But death is consumption and corruption. That means everything is cut short. Now I'm going to use these words to try and explain what it is I am driving at. Now, if you look at it, Lord Holy Spirit, help me. Acts, how do I put this? I, I want to put it in a very simple, very, very simple way. There is a state of death. I'm going to always use, I don't want to talk about, I'm going to use the word state of death. That's the condition of death, right? And I'm going to use the stages of, of, of death. What, when you go for funerals, what happens? Like how, how people view it, right? And I'm going to try and explain what I mean by death and what I mean by life. So please don't get lost. I know it's a bit, it's a bit. So, Jesus is a seed, the incorruptible seed. Man is a seed that has been corrupted using the GMO sample, looking at Adam, like I put that foundation earlier on. In our state of corruption, there are many things we fail to see. And I'm using the word in our state of corruption because even me, I have my limitations because I'm in a state of corruption. For me to have life, for me to change, is to have a life that is dependent on God in Christ Jesus. That is why the Bible says that there is no way to get to the Father. There is no way to transform your seed. There is no way to be what it is God has desired you to be if you don't go by the way, the truth. And the life which is found in the incorruptible seed, Christ Jesus. Therefore, no name has been given to any man here on the earth, beneath the earth, and anywhere else by which one can be saved. Peter was so right about that. I didn't understand it. So I'm, I'm, follow me. And what happens is that in our fallen nature, 
man assumes a level of life that I'm trying. So man tries through religion. Man tries through morality. Man tries through piety. Oh, as for me, I'm pious. As for me, I can do. Man tries through their giving. But the truth and the matter of it all is that anything, any of these struggles, any of these considerations, any of these things which are okay in the eyes of man and in the wisdom of man, that, oh God, can't you see I'm trying with religion, coming to church every day? Can't you see I'm being nice to my neighbor? Can't you see I'm doing everything I can do? In your eyes, you perceive it to be okay. Why? Because you are in your falling state. In our falling state, we consider everything on our efforts and everything that we've done. But I would say all those are good, good intentions, but they are dead on arrival. The only time we become alive is to be alive in Christ Jesus. That is why in John 15, he says what? You cannot be alive if you are not in me. It's dead on arrival. All your efforts, all your passions, all your aspirations, everything you want to do for God, if it's not centered, if it doesn't have a foundation in Christ, is dead on arrival. That's why Peter had to start preaching in the book of Acts. When all those 3,000 and 5,000 people were saved, when he was speaking to the Jewish leaders, he says that, look, in Acts 4, 12, he says, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven, given among men, that we must be saved. When you say it, people think, oh, there are other mediums and religions, there are other inner conscience, and yeah, that is man in his fallen state. Everything looks nice. Everything looks appealing. Why am I saying we are in our fallen state? Paul said that day by day, even we will be getting there closer. I'm going to get there. Stay with me. I know the beginning is, is, is tough to, to, to take off, but we'll get there. I just want you to get a picture because I'll be giving you pictures to support what I'm saying now. So it says, that's why Jesus had to redeem man. Why are we saying Jesus is the only one? Paul gave us the key. Peter gave us the key, sorry. Acts 2. Read Acts 3, Acts 4. What did he say? Now, Jesus is the only person. Right? You know, I kept saying that we are in our falling state. Jesus is the only person. Who never reached the state of death in which man find, finds themselves in? Why am I saying that? The Holy Spirit revealed to David way ahead in Psalm 16, the verse 9 to 11. He says that his body saw no corruption. Death is when, I'm going back to my earlier point, death is corruption. Death is when your seed has been taken over. Death is when the devil seized the seed. After that, it was death. Everything it tries to produce is death because that is not the intended purpose of God. And Peter said that now, Paul said, well, we now have an incorruptible seed that is expected to yield that which God wants. So David was told, Acts 13, Chapter 13, verse 36 to 37. God is a fast guy. God is so sharp. He knew what he was about. Because you know what? If the body of Jesus had seen corruption, it wouldn't have the ability to redeem us because it would be in the same position that we are. And that is why it was so specific. That it says when they had gone to the tomb, the body was out, the cloth of death was laid down, and so was the handkerchief folded to signify that the master was alive and is around. And that he never got to the extent where the body had to rot. 
Because out of that came what? The resurrection, the proof that a seed, an incorruptible seed has come alive. And for which reason you and I have the opportunity. I put in a foundation saying that in our corrupt state, we try and try and try and nothing can come out because the seed is corrupted, is dead. But there had to be a seed. The seed had to come down to your level and the assumption. I know this may sound a bit, but that's what I was taught. In five minutes, all these things were taught. But he had to come to a level. But he didn't transform and totally be at that level because there was no way he could redeem you through that. If you read the straight 1 Corinthians 15, 17. I don't know if we can have that here. But Peter tries to explain it. Paul tries to build on it. And that is why the resurrection of Jesus is so, 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 so important. Now, this is what I'll try to achieve. I know my time is going today. Once I try to explain one, I'll try and explain and give you a picture of the state of death. Because most of the time we assume that we are not dead, I'm alive. Once I can breathe, I'm alive. But perchance, you may be the living dead. You are walking. But you are dead. In, in back home in my country, it's you. you are there. And I'll liken it to the picture. It's good that we are in this season. And, and, and God's time and everything is, is on purpose. You are a zombie. What do zombies want? They are just there. When the crowd is going, your seed is dead. No sense, no brain. I just following. Where the crowd is, there you are. What the situation and the condition is, that is where you are. Question is, are you alive unto God? And look at look at this whole. The, the, you see, man has captured this thing. Oh, I'll get there. I'll get there. Don't go ahead of yourself. Now, what we try and achieve today is that how many of us find ourselves. There, where I'm talking about, but we just haven't realized it. Or we know it, but we are just trying to avoid it. What have we been called for? What are we to do about it? What do we have to, to live for in expectation? Towards this. <laughs> and, 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 and this is the crumb of it all. Write it down and let's go and read it. When, when I started appreciating this, and when I was being schooled, all these, all these verses just started coming alive. What well, the Bible says that nature in its manifold witness is unfolding everything that God is saying. When, when the trees in autumn start shedding their leaves, eh? when corruption starts taking place, shedding their leaves and they drop everything and leaves pile upon, upon, upon leaves, telling you that when you commit one sin, all sin knows is that cover me up, cover me up, cover me up, cover me up. And out of it, rot starts happening. Nature is telling you that there's a season. You are probably walking like a dead person. You need to wake up. Romans 8, 22 to 23. It says that all creation were groaning for the manifestation. We're groaning. And I like it. At first... I always read it thinking that it is the people out there who are groaning for the manifestation. But Paul, Paul included himself, even me. Why? Because we're in our fallen state. We are being renewed each and every day. Each and every day. Until we are revealed with him. Until he takes his church. And that is why we cannot be dead, but we need to be alive and alive in Christ Jesus. Follow me, please. I know there's a tendency to get bored, but let me throw a picture to you. So picture this. By the way, ask your neighbor if they are alive or dead. Are you alive or dead? Okay. As this was giving me to, I'll, is it, that is when we have no hope or no will to live. So there are people you see, say, oh, now nah, I don't want to. I don't want to eat. I don't want to. I want to go. 
right? If you see anybody who wants to go, I want to go. No matter who, I want to go. Death is a state of no contribution. Because at the point of your death, everything is cut off. Your aspirations are cut off. Your purpose is cut off. Any hope you have, any potential in you is gone. There's nothing that can be done about it. For those who have no hope in Christ, for those who are not connected back to the seed, death is the finality for you. When I'm saying there's a, there's a reason for you to be dead or alive, I'm telling you this morning, there's a reason for you to be alive and the only way for you to be alive is to be connected to the incorruptible seed. Because if you are not connected and you are not found within the branch, what did John 15 one says? It says that for the branches that bore no fruit, the father had no use of them. He cut them and he what? Chucked them out. Jesus had to emphasize that message again. When last week we, we studied the fig tree. He says he came up to the fig tree expecting to get because he is the Lord of the harvest. And he came and there was no harvest on it. And he says, then why are, you, why are you leaving? What is your purpose? If I, the master of the harvest, I've come to you and you yield not anything. And we emphasized last week because the fig tree didn't know its season or time. It was waiting for the time of men. Men say, men say that in this time and in this season, that is when I'll bear fruit. But I'm building back to where I started. It says that God is the one who determines the time and the season. So when the Lord of the harvest comes, he's not waiting. The Lord of the harvest has expectation because he has planted a seed that is incorruptible in you. And he has an expectation. That's why John 15, 1 tells us that they that bear fruit, they who attempt or try and produce, even in their nature, he says that then he begins to help them by pruning them. And when he prunes them, they what? They bear more fruits. Lord, help us bear more fruits. Lord, help us bear more fruits. We need to be alive, church. We need to be alive. Now, when you are dead, a couple of things happen. Death robs you of the power to transform or control the outcomes and situations around you. You are dead. The shoe you wear, the dress you wear, everything. People will determine it for you. The money you left, people will start chopping for, for you. You were meticulous. Oh, as for me, I did everything. Even, even, even in your death, when you open one of your eyes and look, the way that people are spending your money, uncontrollably and without measure. If you had the power to control that, you'd have been in place. Not, no, is that not it? I was just about to use some paging. So is anyone in a state of death. You think you are living life. You think life, everything is okay. You are not connected to the true vine. That is the Christ Jesus. You think having everything, all the lavish houses and everything, you think you are in control. Information to you this morning is that you are not in control. You have never been in control. You are a zombie that is being puppeted. And you are walking through the seasons of life. Till the master of time and the season will say, enough. I don't see any fruit in you. That's why Jesus told his disciples, says that you are waiting, saying that, ah, there's a certain season. There's a certain time for the harvest. But I tell you, the harvest is now your time of harvest, your time of visitation is now. It's not going to come tomorrow. It is with you. It is with you. The kingdom of, the, of God is with you. What is the kingdom? That the seed of righteousness will be propagated. That is the kingdom. And the kingdom is centered on only one person. That is Christ. And he is the man, Christ Jesus he is the way, the truth, and the light. No one else gets to the sower except through him. No one else is counted to partake in the harvest except through him. So that is a state. If you look at how funerals happen, 
They, they are, their choices, even on the day when they, they wear you the clothes on the bed and you are dead, even the choice of clothes, there are some things when you open your eyes and see, ah, this color, who, 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 whose idea was this? I don't even like color green. But it's not within your control. It's not within your control. The state of death leaves us at the mercy of so-called friends and loved ones. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> There are people who love you, people who really love. But you notice that when you are dead, that's when you see a grandfather or an auntie or somebody who never existed. They take over and they are in charge. You have no control. There are people who weep and after that, how much money, how much pounds did he have in his account? Oh, a couple of two million pounds. Oh, we have to do this funeral now. <laughs> Let him go. <laughs> Where's the trust? Let's see the trust first. You are the mercy of people. And you know what? Let me liken, to, let me liken it, it to this. But these people every day, just like you, just like me, there are people in a state of death who haven't come to know Christ Jesus. We sit with them in the same classroom. We go to the same gyms with them. We sit, they are work colleagues. We speak to every day. But we have no concern for them. We're only waiting for that day when they die for us to go and then we come and stand. Our colleague was a very lovely person. A soul, a gentle soul. A gentle soul. You watched on. You watched on as they marched. They were zombilized and they were going. And, you're, and you know that you know that you know that a word from you could have Walking them up from the state of zombieism. But you watched on. And we call ourselves friends. If we don't know this, the Bible says, let's ask. Ask Adam and his wife Eve. Genesis 3, 4 and 5. They were perfect human beings. The Bible says that God created them and said, yes, I created. Even Adam confirmed what God, so it says, they are the bone of my bone, the flesh of my bone. This one, she's sharp. But the devil came in, subjugated them, enslaved them, abducted, kidnapped them from God. But you know the worst part? I'll be building on that as we get there. There are people who have been kidnapped. There are people who are in a state of hijack. The state of death. A state of death is when, oh, Everything is fine. I'm alive. But you are being controlled by the devil. You have no control over the way you relate to alcohol. You have no control about uh, uh, the way you, you relate to the opposite sex. Anything in skirt and blouse is game. You have no control over your own self. You, and you know what? The funny thing is that you are sitting behind the stair. And you can see that where I'm going... I wish I could stop this thing. I wish I could. You are in a state of death. You have no control. Yet, yet, you are contributing to the guy who is keeping you in captivity. When I, when I say, the Holy Spirit said, now look at what they call the, the Stockholm effect. <laughs> the Stockholm effect, eh? I'm just going to read that. It says what? The, the St Stockholm syndrome, eh? It's when somebody has been kidnapped. Against their will, against everything that they do, which obviously the devil has. You have been kidnapped against everything that you stand for. You are with him. Pe -pe -pe. He says that as time goes on, now you are developing a feeling of trust or affection. Felt in many cases, a, a feeling of trust and, and affection by the victim, by the victim towards the captor. So when you are in a state of death, oh, it's all right, it's all right. It's only, it's only offering. Oh, oh, churches are taking money and they are doing this. And it's meant to propagate the kingdom. But when you are in a state of death, you are now supporting, you are now, involuntarily, you don't know, but you are supporting the guy who is keeping you in captivity. And the Bible says that Christ came, that we will be ransomed. Ransomed. Ransomed means... Jesus has paid the price in full. 
the price against corruption of the body he has paid in full. This state of death in which you find yourself. Because he didn't become corrupted, he was able to pay for your corruption. Because if he assumed that level of corruption, he won't be in a position to also redeem you. But it says that he brought a blank check and says, I have redeemed this one. This corruption, this corruption I have now made incorruptible. And yet still, in a state of death, you are there. You have been redeemed. But you want to be with your captor. I'm comfortable here. When that starts to happen, when you note that there are symptoms, when you start dying, eh? when people are dying, they begin to know they are dying. So let me give you some of I have to jump through some. I'm not sure. I'm looking at the time. I'll, I'll be able to make it. I'll be able to make it. Go. When, when you start dying, hmm? it says that you, you begin to have signals. What are some of these signals? That's when you are getting into death mode. And we started this year studying all these things. Now, you start having less gratitude. Gratitude towards human. No, gratitude towards God. When you wake up and you are alive and you are connected to the vine. Gratitude is anything you keep doing. It keeps coming. When you start dying off, gratitude doesn't mean anything. Uh, God created so, so what? They're praising. Why, why do I clap? Why do I dance? Why do I? Well, for what? It's indicating you may be in a state of death. Or oh, you are dying gradually. Service. Service in the house. Oh, people are abusing. Oh, you are taking the position of a captor. You are, you are assuming he doesn't want to spread the kingdom. Obviously, his is corruption, right? But service to the Lord now becomes something big to you. But when you are in a state of death, or you are in a state of zombie land, what is service? To do what? You start throwing, chucking it away. Now faith. Faith starts to die off. Faith in who? Faith in the son of God that he's able to redeem you, has redeemed you and continually every day redeems you. For he is our redeemer. Why do you think he stands in heaven and he mediates every day? Mediating on our behalf. Why? The state of corruption, it needs to be revived. It needs to, and that is why he's there. He's doing his part daily. But your faith in him is growing less. You are being transformed, zombilized. Forgive me, I'm using the word zombie, but you know, the film actors, it, it's an intricate design in man that has been put into the movies that you are watching. Because the moment a zombie bites the correct person, sooner or later, they also start behaving like that. They lose their brain and then they follow the crowd. When you start dying, or when you're in a state of paralysis or near to death, now, the daily overcoming, that spirit that Christ has put in you, that every day you are looking forward, looking forward, taking territories, taking charge, taking dominion, it goes out. Adam, where are you? Ah, we are hiding. We have given up. Adam, where are you? Oh, we are hiding. We have given up. Giving towards the kingdom of God. And that I need to emphasize is good. Uh, all the preaching for today, it was said as we went through the school of the word and everything. And these are very important things. These are very important things. All those things need and, and they matter. Now, we have been put in a position to change things. Look at it this way. I'm going to try another picture. When the hairs is going, the pool, we love you, mom, flowers, everything. We give all the speeches and everything. But if you were given the opportunity to help, you didn't. When you were called upon, we, we keep praying. We pray upon the Lord to send helpers in the time of harvest. You are the helper. Your words matter. The influence, what your life stands for, it's meant to change somebody. Most of the times we, we don't, we don't realize, realize this, but it's very important. Your finances actually is the least of what you should be thinking of. Now, where do we have this example from? Luke 16, 28 to 31. He says, a man, a certain man was rich. Lazarus did not have. Blah, blah, blah. Now, the rich man 
in the height of, of what happened there. He didn't say, please send them so that my money will be kept well or tell them to pay my money to the church. But the, the rich man now realized that, well, it's not, he had something more than wealth to give and that was to take care of Lazarus. That was to reach out. That was to be life unto somebody in that situation. But he failed. How do we know that? It says that now when he said that, uh, give me water. He forgot what about, but now his key focus was, please send somebody. First he said, let me go. Give me an opportunity again. Let me go back and correct that which I didn't do. Let me go back and tell my worker, my colleague in the office that, look, this life, this zombie state, this state of death, please, there's no need. Give me that opportunity. Can you imagine the number of people who have been driven in, in, in houses and crossed to the cemetery line and the people standing in the cemetery just wishing that I wish I could just go back again? Because you know what? God has put you in a time, a season, and has put you in a purpose and a place in such that there are words that Jerel will speak to a peer in uni, right? That will go straight to their heart and they will respond to than even their own father and their own mother. You are seated here today. There are words that when you open your mouth to speak to a friend, your influence is even more than their wife or your influence is even more than their husband. And those words have been put into you for you to declare. But you know what? Because you are looking at your own self. What will I get from it? Should I say this? G -G -G Jesus, look. We carry the seed. The word of God needs to be amplified through your mouth to that peer. Lord, help me. Lord, help me. So what are you doing? You need to go out. But because of the pain, you'd rather stay in your state of death. I'd rather be dead. I don't want to encounter anything. Jesus knew that and said that the moment you wake up from your state of death and you start changing things around you, you will face opposition. Matthew 10, 20 to 22. Jesus said it. He said it there. Can, can we have it there? If, if I only read this one <laughs> and, and I close. It's a state of condition. We need to go telling. We need to go telling people. We need to change it. Matthew, the chapter 10, the verse 20 to 22. You can note it down if you don't have it. It says a brother will come against brother. Uh, Matthew 10, 22. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, for... Oh, let's, let's go back. Uh, 20 to 22. So, uh, yeah. So, so, yeah. So, I, I'm going to read. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of... So, it says that the moment you start waking people up from the state of captivity which the devil has placed them under, the moment you start waking them up, resistance will come. That resistance... The spirit of God is the one who will help you. For no one can find him but it's through his spirit, right? It says that when the spirit wakes you up, it will even bring confusion. Ah, are you the only one who is, is born again in this house? You don't even allow, then you are doing too much church, too much Jesus, too much Jesus. In this office, you are doing this, you are doing this. It will bring separation. That separation is because people in a state of death don't we are, we are all in debt. Why are you telling us? The moment you wake up to your realization, the moment you start being active and coming alive, there's resistance, even from your own home, even from the people in the church. Ah, it's too much. Acts tells us that, and now the people gathered together. They did four things. They followed in the doctrine of the apostles. They broke bread together. They fellowshiped. And the last one was they prayed. These four things. Gather people. Church say, let's do. Ah, these things are too much. These things are too much. Contention. Why are they contending? Because of his name. Because all these activities of coming to life will end up in one place. And that will project the name of Jesus. When his name comes in, everything changes. That is why God selected a man, a cripple, for over 40 years. 
took in Peter and John to change his position. Why did he then? Peter had the opportunity to say that all these things that you see, they have been done in whose name? His name. Now to end, because I can't end. And oh, I need to talk about the, the bit of life. But, but this is very important. Joel 1.4. And this is the point coming out of that. Death creeps on us. Adam and Eve, death creeped on them. Joel 1.4 says that, and this is the condition, when death is creeping on you to destroy you, it says what? The chewing locust will first deal with you. It says, what, what, <laughs> what the chewing locust did, uh, it talks about the palmer worm, which is the chewing locust, the, the palmer worm, the locust, the canker worm, and the caterpillar. Whatever the palmer worm will leave in destroying you as you are being chopped off, what he couldn't finish consuming, the locust will consume. What the locust f- couldn't finish consuming, the canker worm will deal with. What the canker worm couldn't do, the consuming locust will do it. So the Bible describes them in, in Joel 1 4. It says, There's a chewing locust, there's a swarming locust, there's a crawling locust, and there's a consuming locust. That is the level. You are being taken, you are being taken away. So we need to be mindful and Having to um, force land this and really end, it says that look, Psalm 118, verse 17, David said, I shall live, I shall not die, but live and recount the works of the Lord. There was a reason why he said that. David said, Other than me to be dead, other than me to find my sta- myself in a state of death always, unconcerned, not moved. Lying to myself that I'm part of the vine and not. I'd rather be alive. And he didn't end there. He says that I shall not die but live to recount the works. What are the works of God? John 15 one says that what? That we will bear fruits. That is being alive. So long and short church. It is not enough to be living. But you need to be alive. Alive in Christ Jesus. To be dead. There are times when you can walk and you are dead. But we need to be alive. So say to yourself this morning. Let's, let's just pray. I, I couldn't finish it but let's just pray. I, I, I just hope that the Lord minister to your spirit this morning. Wherever you are. You, you, let's just pray. All I want us to do is that. You just want to rededicate yourself. Saying that Lord. I want to be alive unto you. I want to be alive unto you. Alive in everything I do. This zombie state. Where I don't even know what I mean. And I'm walking, thinking that I am alive. The state of death, you are just there. Like a house. Picture it this way. If you can't get the picture, it's a house. The moment the occupants of a house leave, cracks start beginning. Windows are falling apart. Doors are falling apart. Everything just goes down. Mold is building up and everything. But the moment life comes to that building, Fresh lake of paint, doors restored, everything. The same house that was broken down and destroyed and corrupted comes alive. That same house. So you're saying this morning that, Lord, I want to be alive. I don't want to have a house that is abandoned. I want to be alive. That's all I want you to pray and say, the Lord. And if anybody is who needs me to be alive, oh Lord, let me reach them. Not like the rich man. The rich man realized that the money was gone. But there was a purpose. He had to be alive to make an impact. Change his brother's position. Lift up your hand wherever you are. It's just a simple prayer. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you. That house of favor, restoration, provisions, ministry will be alive. That restoration temple will be alive. That the RPMI mandate, O Lord, will be alive. And that Father, like we're connecting the fathers back to the children, Lord, help us, O Lord. Let us not walk in a state of zombie world and being dead, O Lord. But let us be alive unto you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray it with thanksgiving. Amen.